Now, if we want to focus in the following mi minutes what the Lord expects from us, all of us are in a spiritual journey, and our church has invited us to meditate in the following five years in reaching the world. So if we need to sit together as we are doing these days to prepare strategies to reach the world, in this division territory means how we will reach 1.3, 1.4 billion people. How we will reach them. What we will write. What will be the plans. But in that way of thinking, the church wants to invite us to think in three dimensions. Reach up, reach in, and reach out. So taking in consideration that, I want to express some of the lessons of the Bible for our success in our spiritual life. When we say, let's reach up, each one of us, each church member, we are speaking reaching up to the Lord. Means having a closer and closer daily relationship with the Lord. Do you remember Christ had a wonderful experience? He was in close relationship with his Father. And was such that relationship that that Thursday evening in Gethsemane Garden, when he, his hand was shaking and the cup he wanted to avoid. If it is possible, Father, pass over from me this cup. Now, if all of you that are fathers, you want the best for your children, correct? So what do you think was great a sacrifice for Christ or for the Father? This prayer, a difficult question, because the Father needed to decide. And if the father was deciding for the son to take the cup of his raft, raft. So what is that cup? Is the final judgment of the Lord to destroy forever sin. Is what we call the second death. Is the death forever. And that was what the Lord, the Father, was asking the Son to take in our behalf. So when Christ assumed, and that is a miracle difficult to understand, we will use eternity to understand his love and the dimensions of love and sacrifice. But when Christ decided to assume in his life your and my sins, what happened with that relationship? was broken. That way of reaching up to his father that he enjoyed so much and the gospels are full of passages saying early in the morning Christ was praying. Late at night Christ was praying. Christ not only prayed but meditated. Christ studied the word of God. He answered each temptation with it is written. So what Ellen G. White says that we need to do daily, you remember, in Testimony, Volume 6, says we need to do three things each day. To pray, to meditate, and to study the Word of God. That is the way of reaching up. And do you remember what the Apostle wrote in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is a very well-known Bible passage. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, and let us, what says verse 2? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When we want to reach up, we need to fix our eyes 
in Christ. And what a wonderful thing here in SUD, SUD for leaders, pastors, and church members all together to fix our eyes in Christ. Do you remember that experience in Matthew? is recorded in several gospels, Matthew 14, starting with verse 23. After he had dismissed them, speaking about Christ, he went up on the mountain side by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there, how says? Alone. What about the disciples? Christ was praying alone. And that makes me remember what is happening with us, the leaders, the pastor and church member. Is Christ praying alone or he is with us or we are with him praying? The importance of prayer. But the boat, 24, the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Verse 25, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, is it I? Don't be afraid. Verse 28, Peter, the disciple, said, if you are, tell me to come to you on the water. And what says Christ in verse 29? Come. Now, Peter then received the answer to his question, but the question was full of doubt. Because he said, if, if you are, give the order for me to go. And Christ said, come. So he went out of the boat in the middle of the storm that night and he found some station in, in the water and started to walk in the water. But look what Ellen G. White says about focusing in Christ, fixing our eyes in Christ, like says Hebrew 12. Focusing in Christ, Peter walked with security. But when with self-confidence he looked back to his friends in the boat, his eyes departed from Christ. The wind was terrible. The wave grew up in great height. And during an instant, Christ was occulted from his sight. And his faith abandons him. He started to sink and when death was speaking to him in the midst of the wave, and when he focused again in Christ, he shouted and exclaimed loud, Lord, save me. A very short prayer, because no time to make an introduction. No? Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus took his extended hand, saying, O oh man of little faith, why have you doubted? He started with a doubt. If you are, give the order to walk. Now he was very proud. Can you see? It's a question of seconds and minutes. He was walking by faith when he had fixed his eyes in Christ. But after a few seconds, he was full of pride. <laughs> this is Peter. And what about you, the other disciples in the boat? He lost sight. The Bible says that the wind was contrary and the wave was very great and he lost sight, lost sight of Christ. What is our situation this evening for all the members of the executive committee of SUD? What is my personal situation? Are the winds of concern, stress, expectation, what will happen with us, it's time of election, are the winds so hard 
and the wave that we face in our family or with our children or the pastors in charge of several churches or the lay members to witness for the Lord in the workplace. What are the winds that we are facing and the waves? Are we losing sight and direction of where is Christ? So first condition to follow Christ with success and to prepare a harvest is to reach up, is to focus our eyes in Christ. Second condition is the Bible text that we just heard. It's First Chronicles 22. It's a wonderful message that elderly father and King David was telling to his beloved son Solomon, to whom he selected by indication of the Lord to be the next king. First Chronicles 22, verse 11. Now, my son, it's like saying, let's speak seriously. Now, my son, the Lord be with you, and may you have success, and build the house of the Lord your God, as he said you would. Remember, David wanted to construct the house. But he, the Lord said, you will not do it. It will be your son. Now we are Israel, spiritual Israel. We are living in the last years of the history of this world. The Lord is inviting us to prepare a harvest. In other words, to build the house for the Lord. To build his spiritual people. To go to the ark. To participate of the salvation and the kingdom of heaven that the Lord is preparing. Now, if we want to have success to build God's kingdom here in earth, we need to follow this advice. And the advice was, verse 12, may the Lord give you discretion and understanding. Are we praying for wisdom? Are we praying for, for discretion? and for understanding, to understand the times that we are living, to understand the news and things and events in this world that are showing us that Christ is coming soon. Are we praying for discretion or, or we have our own agenda, the list, our things, the things that we more love and, and we have that list and we check the list for the Lord to answer us. Pray for discretion and understanding. And when he puts you in command of over Israel, so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God, to follow Christ's pathway for your life. And then Luke what says, verse 13, 1 Chronicles 22, 13. Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and laws that the Lord gave to Moses for Israel. And then this you need to underline in your Bible. The end of verse 13 is two commands, two orders. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Be strong and courageous. You know what happened in our spiritual life? First, we need to focus in Christ. How many church members we had here in SUD in the last 40, 50 years as an example, and that today are not more with us? Many. They are not more with us. They lost sight. The contrary wind erased their faith. So one is to focus in Christ. Second is to be strong and courageous. To reach out to the people of this world, we need to exercise that. You know, I have spent the last 15 years in the Euro-Asia division, the former countries of the USSR, Russia, Ukraine. My colleagues visited many of these countries. And uh, we have the Stan countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Afghanistan. Many Stan countries, difficult, all of them, Muslim countries. And then the Transcaucasus, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, many countries. You know, I heard of my colleagues, the missionaries, how they suffer 
you know, when the military service was enforced and all young men of 18 years needed to go to the military service. It was very tough. And our young boys and girls were dedicated in the churches where they belong. And they prayed for the Lord to bless. As an example, Vladimir Ivanovich, they prayed for Vladimir. Vladimir wanted to be a medical doctor, but in the university, they don't allow him to study medicine because he was Seventh-day Adventist. And he was not participating of the activities of the Communist Party. So he could not study medicine. So they took him to the military service. But the Lord gave Vladimir a great physical strength, and he was a sportman. You know this game, ping pong? Ping pong? He was the champion in Ukraine of ping pong. But he went to the military service, and they forced him to work in Sabbath. And he said, no, I will respect my Lord. I want to be faithful to my Lord. I will not serve in Sabbath. And they put him in jail many times. And as to Vladimir, they made to other pastors and leaders today in the Eurasia division. Be strong and courageous. Be strong, and the Lord will be with us. I can tell you many stories, but we don't have time this evening. So, first secret to follow Christ successfully. Focus your eyes in Christ. Have time to meditate, to pray, and to study the scripture each day. Second, be strong and courageous. When you will study in your different unions and conference and mission and sections and institutions, what strategy you will follow to reach the world and reach the people of this world with the message of hope, be strong and courageous. I want to tell you, Spirit of Prophecy says, it will come difficult times in the future, near future. Are we ready to face those difficult times? Are we ready? Are we ready to stand for Christ and to be strong and courageous? And then let's go to the third one, the third secret to have a successful spiritual life. Among many others, the third one we find in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. It's a very nice one and crucial in our spiritual life. John 15. In John 15, Christ described the relationship between the Lord and each one of us with the parable of the vine and the branches, or with the, that figure for us to understand. In verse 1, John 1, uh, 15, 1, she says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. What says in verse 4? Verse 4, remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. That is a crucial secret and lesson of the Bible. Not only to focus in Christ. Many people look to Christ, take a decision for baptism, and after lose sight of the Lord. Not only to be strong and courageous, but the third is crucial. Remain in Christ. If we remain in Christ, then we will have the power, you know? I am the vine and you are the branches. The branches are the ones that take fruit, but without relationship with the vine, nothing will happen. We will dry and we will be burned. So we need to be connected and we need to remain. Look what says two chapters before, John 13, John 13, and verse 35, John 13 and verse 35. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. How the world will know the truth and how the world will know that we are his disciples in order to make disciples. How? How finish verse 35? If you love one, 
another if you love. So are we fulfilling God's will? Are we enough connected with the vine that we will love one another? That we will have a good spiritual atmosphere among us? That we will have the attitude of Christ, the words of Christ, the attitude of love, love and respect? In that way, we can reach to others and invite them to follow Christ. Peter summarized in 2 Peter chapter 1, summarized these virtues that the Lord wants to see in our life. 2 Peter 1, 5 to 8. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and improductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes in Christ. Be strong and courage. And thirdly, remain in Christ. You know, when I was a little kid, my dad was working as the vice president for academic affairs in a school like this one, but in our homeland in Argentina. And the church wanted our school, our college, to grow up and to become a university. Therefore, they made a plan for him to go to United States and to visit all the colleges we have. It was one year trip. So we went in that trip and we went as a family. Daddy, mommy, my oldest brother, 11 years, my sister, 10, I was seven, and youngest brother, four years old. At the middle of that trip and that year, visiting our Seventh-day Adventist colleges, we had, sorry to say, a car accident, and my dad passed away. My mother was 36 years old, 36, a young girl with four children. And we returned to the, that village in our school, and mommy worked hard, worked hard, she was daughter of British missionaries. She translated all the books coming from General Conference for our theology seminary. And she translated to Spanish for our young boys to be trained as for future pastors. And we grew up in that environment. But I noticed that my youngest brother had a very great trauma and he cried and he said, you know, I cannot remember my father. I was four years old, I cannot remember, you know? It's an emptiness. And nevertheless, he attended, like all of us, our Seventh-day Adventist schools, so he was baptized when he was 13 years, but when he became a teenager, he was very strong physically, and the environment of his friend was not good. And he decided by himself to leave the church and to live a worldly, life. So it was very sad. I was studying in the university until late at night, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning I was studying and before going to my bedroom to sleep, I noticed that my mother's bedroom was with a light. So I was looking to the bedroom of mommy and she was kneeling down at the side of the bed praying all night because one of the four children was missing. Bible says, remain in Christ. And youngest brother was not there. The years passed. He went to work in a big factory in Buenos Aires City. I was working already as a missionary. And one day the phone ring to our union where I was working and they said, because my mother accepted a call to go to work to South American Division in Brasilia, and they said, 
the secretaries of the South American division had a terrible accident, car accident. By the way, Ruina Moore was the driver. Ruina Moore that worked in the GC. And, and my mother was almost dying. Long distance from Buenos Aires, long distance in Brazil. And she was taken by plane to a seven-day Adventist hospital to try to save her life. And I phoned my brother and said, Charlie, mommy is dying. And he could not speak by phone. He said, I cannot believe how the Lord will do this to me. I don't have father. And now all what I have is mother. I will lose my mother. And he said he was 20 years old. And in our country, 21 years old for, for majority of age. He could not travel to, to Brazil unless he has a attorney power of the mother, given authorization. So he said, Billy, you go there and get an authorization of mommy. And I will go and I will say to mommy, before you pass away, I, you need to know that I will return to the church. And I went, returned with the document, and Charlie went to Brazil. And he spent the next four months, four months, day and night, at the side of the bed of mommy. The Lord made a small miracle, and my mother recovered a little bit of health, but was totally paralyzed, paralyzed. And she survived four years, four years. The Lord extended her life four years. In the middle of those four years, one day my brother came to me and said, Billy, are you willing to give me all the Bible lessons again? Bible lessons again. I want to study again the word of God. And you know what joy was each evening? to meet with my youngest brother and study again the word of God. And can you imagine that day that he decided to be rebaptized in a small church that we attended in big Buenos Aires city. We have like 120 churches there, but we were attending and to work in a small church and the pastor was going to rebaptize Charlie. And we brought by ambulance my mother from our university to Buenos Aires, and she was in a wheelchair, and she saw when Charlie was rebaptized. He was reconnected to the vine. And the pastor said, Wendy, are, are you willing to come to the front and give the baptism certificate to your son? And she passed, all the church members were crying. And that night, when we returned home, when all the program was finished, when we returned home, she said to me, you know, Billy, this is the greatest day of my life. Because our, my son that was lost is found. And the one that Christ came to save was the lost lamb is back at home. And she said, the Lord can take me to rest. Because what a terrible thing will be if Christ will come and we will join again with daddy, with our father, and he will say, where are the four children? And look if one is missing. But now we are all together again, walking to the promised land. I want to fix my eyes in Christ. I want to be strong and courageous to reach out to the people of this world. And I want to remain in Christ with my family and with all the church members of the world. What about you? Do you want to do the same? Let's stand for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, our hearts are full of gratitude for your love, your compassion, your forgiveness, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in the cross of Calvary, the work of the Holy Spirit touching our hearts for us to repent, for us to confess, and for us to be willing to follow you each day of our life. Thank you because the Word of God is inviting us to fix our eyes in Christ. 
You are inviting us to be strong encouragers, to go ahead to all the cities and towns here of India, of Bhutan, Nepal, and Maldives, to finish their work and to bring hope to the people of this world. But also, and very important, you're asking us that daily we will remain in Christ. For us to go back and bring all the ones that are not at home, invite former church members to come back to home, to come back to Christ. And what a joy will be not only with us, but in heaven for one that becomes to repentance. So this evening, in the middle of these year-end meetings, we want to consecrate our life to you. Receive the dedication of our life. Help us to focus in Christ and not in our personal agenda. And help us to be faithful to you, to be strong and courageous and to remain in you. Because we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.